Greetings, everyone. We'll get started in a little bit. In a little bit less than a minute. All right. Greetings and good evening. My name is Eric Brown. I'm a high school biology teacher in Evanston, Illinois, just north of Chicago. And I wanted to get started by saying hello um, and that the National Education Association, I'm a member of the executive committee, the National Education Association, also known as NEA, is committed to honoring the spaces that we occupy to advance the work. So I'm going to begin by acknowledging that we, no matter where you are in this country, meet on traditional lands. Chicago, where I live, and you can see behind me, is located on the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations. Um, many other tribes, such as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, the Nominee, Sac, and Fox, also called this area home. And the region has long been a center for indigenous people to gather, trade, and maintain kinship ties. Today, one of the largest urban American indigenous communities in the United States resides in Chicago. Members of the community continue to contribute to the life of this city and to celebrate their heritage, practice traditions, and care for the land and waterways. So we honor America's first peoples and all elders, past, present, and emerging. And we're called on to learn what we can about their tribal histories, their cultures, and their contributions that have been suppressed in telling the story of America. And just as it was at the end of the last school year, so it is at the beginning of this one. Educators and families must work together to ensure the social emotional health and well-being of students, as well as their continued academic growth. This partnership is not only important, it represents the dual role that many educators themselves are in during this time. They are teaching students and working with their own children who may be involved in remote learning. So on behalf of the 3 million members of the National Education Association and the families that we work with, I bring greetings. And I share that this partnership with WETA Public Television and the NEA in support of families is one that benefits all of us. And although we are traveling in different vessels, we are all traveling through this COVID experience together. Now we've got some resources for you. And one of the ways that you can reach out and connect to these resources is online. And who isn't a master of online anymore? So for those resources, please visit www.educatingthroughcrisis, that's one word, .org. This site, educatingthroughcrisis.org, has supports for families, educators, and community members. And while we're not gonna solve all the problems, we are hopeful that those resources and our conversation today can help. Speaking of that conversation, let me explain how our time together will work. We have a panel and we're, the panel's gonna have uh, three people on it. We're gonna have a couple of prepared questions, but then we hope to engage in a dialogue with the panelists around the relevant issues. Participants, please use the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you would like to ask a question. We're gonna start with each panelist having about five to seven minutes to answer an initial question. And then we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience and other questions um, that I've come up with uh, as I've heard from the panelists. So uh, let's start with the panelists. Our first panelist is Bethany Robertson. She is an experienced social entrepreneur with a track record of launching innovative social ventures 
as the co-founder and co-director of Parents Together. Bethany has built a nationwide parent community that is 2.5 million members strong. Bethany also co-founded the I Do Foundation and the Center for Progressive Leadership. Prior to that, she served as executive director of DC-based College Bound. And after earning a degree in elementary education and psychology from the University of Michigan, Bethany started her career at the National Head Start Association, where she focused on building partnerships between Head Start programs and other community services. Bethany, I went to Head Start when I was a little boy too. Um, so thank you for your work with uh, Head Start. Bethany is passionate about parent leadership and fostering parent power. She is a longtime resident of Washington, DC, where she lives with her partner, two kids, and a puppy. Our second panelist is Kwesi Rollins. He guides the Institute for Educational Leadership portfolio of programs designed to develop and support leaders with a particular emphasis on family and community engagement, early childhood education, and community-based leadership development. Mr. Rollins directs the Le Direct District Leaders Network on Family and Community Engagement and Leaders for Today and Tomorrow, an initiative that designs and delivers professional learning and support opportunities for school and district leaders. He holds an MSW degree from the University of Maryland at Baltimore School of Social Work, where he was a maternal and child health leadership training fellow. Our third panelist, Rodrigo Rodriguez Tovar, works as an elementary bilingual dual language literacy coach and provides interventions to students with dyslexia and dysgraphia at Cook Elementary in Austin ISD. Mr. Rodriguez Tovar is a national board certified teacher in the area of middle childhood generalist and a former national board fellow for the uh, MBPTS. He's a facilitator at the district level and a big advocate for great public schools and dual language. He works with the NEA's English Language Learners Cadre in providing professional development workshops to educators across the nation with advocacy for ELLs, standards-based instruction, and lesson development for ELLs, as well as an assessment of ELLs. Mr. Rodriguez is also a NEA blended learning mentor and facilitator and helps teachers who are pursuing their national board teaching certification. His research interests center on issues of language, culture, equity, and identity especially as they affect or are affected by biliteracy practices. So we have some really phenomenal, phenomenal panelists. And the conversation that we're going to have today is hopefully going to be very informative to all of you. And please type your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom. But let's start with Bethany. Um, Ms. Robertson, what are parents asking for support with? Yeah, great. Um, thank you for having me. And it's really, it's an honor to be here. And I wouldn't normally say this, but I'm happy to be here and I'm exhausted. Um, and I share that in this context because I think what you're asking is what are people, what are parents dealing with right now? Um, and just as a parent, N of one, <laughs> I can tell you um, that I'm exhausted, but what we hear from our 2.5 million members across the country is really that parenting and working, supporting our families is really a completely impossible situation right now. Um, parents are struggling with this completing or competing needs of both providing for their families, but then also being around to care for their families. And it feels like that is um, really an overwhelming and completely unsustainable task right now. Thus, I am tired, but I also know almost every parent in this country right now is exhausted. Um, so we've really been hearing kind of four distinct needs, big buckets of needs from our family. So I thought I would just kind of share some of the things that we're hearing from um, our parents across the country. And the first one, uh, I know this is a conversation about education and school, but I think it's so critical uh, that the most um, kind of important and timely need that parents have is around their own financial economic security. Um, parents are hurting, families are hurting. This is the context in which our kids are approaching the new school year, right? Um, folks are telling us that whatever government support they may have gotten early in the pandemic is gone, that they weren't able to get on unemployment in the first place, or that they had to quit their positions in order to be able to be home to provide care for young children or other family members. Um, we have stories from all over the country, Colorado, Georgia, North Carolina, 
um, of people saying they are already trading off between bills, what they're paying uh, month to month, rent, meds, food, all these things. So, you know, in the midst of that, parents are also facing the return to school and virtual learning and saying, how can I possibly afford the internet? Um, I know my kids need this to learn, but you know, when we hear from a dad who says he and his kids are eating literally every other day, um, the internet and devices become really secondary concerns. So I think it's critical to start there. Um, Feeding America estimates that one in four kids will be facing food insecurity by the end of the year. Uh, so that's, that's the way we're beginning the school year. Um, and I think that that context is just so critical as we think about what families need and sort of what we're asking of them. Um, the second big bucket, I think parents feel really weighed down by choices right now. There's this constant Tetris of what's safe? What can I do? Can I have this caregiver come in? Can I see my, my mother-in-law so she can help take the kids through some of the week? Um, should I send them to school in person? Should we do a hybrid? Should I opt out? Should I do virtual? And they're just these kind of overwhelming weight of choices. Uh, New York City started school today, of course, one of the, the country's biggest districts. I've heard from dozens of parents saying they still don't know if they're going to go in person. So there's just kind of this decision fatigue of what's okay to do, what isn't, and what are the needs of my family in the mix of that. Um, the third bucket, I really do want to think and focus a bit on what we're hearing from families who have already started back to school this year. Um, first thing I would say is parents see the superhuman effort that teachers and educators are making to make this work. We see that, and yet it still feels like a lose-lose proposition for almost everyone involved. Um, I have a 10-year-old, and he is in a fantastic public school. Uh, he's expected to be on Zoom five and a half hours a day of synchronous learning. Um, across the country, we're just hearing parents say, we see what you're trying to provide, we're grateful for that, and it's just too much. Um, also, on the parent side, people are saying it's just way too much being expected of families. Um, so again, fantastic programming for our younger learners. I have a five-year-old. Um, it is practically expected that I be there continuously with her during that class time. Um, and families are just saying it's, it's too much. I can't do the things that teachers expect parents to do in order for my child to be present, well-supplied, and on task. Um, another Challenge, of course, is the technology, um, but it's not just figuring out the platforms, it's also like getting the printouts, it's connecting to the internet, it's you know, making sure that you have enough power to like, get on the Zoom call. It's, there are all these little micro things that add up to just challenge upon challenge, especially when you have multiple children. Um, and then I think that what that all leads to is a, a lot of friction. So we're worried about the quality of learning that's actually able to happen when you've got so much that teachers just have to do to keep everyone present. Um, and then also whether kids are gonna fall behind. So uh, again, just huge gratitude and props to the teachers and the educators and all that they're doing. And we're all sort of in this hard, very difficult to navigate situation. Um, the final bucket of things I hear from families most acutely right now is around mental health. And of course, you know, parents, we're all dealing with our own emotional strain and mental health challenges, um, balancing the load and just kind of like navigating our own questions about uncertainties and future. Um, but parents are very concerned about their kids' social emotional development. You know, our little ones are not in the classroom. They're not learning about how to form positive peer relationships. Instead, they're learning an awful lot about uh, online communication. And we're also worried about older kids um, who are not able to have the social connection they need and to be building the independence that they need right now. So I think there's a real hidden pandemic of a mental health crisis that's happening writ large across the country, but is especially acute for families um, with kids who are feeling very isolated. So I think what are parents asking for? Um, first and foremost, they need our compassion and they need additional economic support. More importantly, really concrete access to food in particular. Um, I think they're asking to simplify what we are expecting and providing to children educationally. And um, the other thing I really wanna mention is a real a focus on equity. Um, there's just such a disproportionate effect on, on our kids, black and brown families. And I think parents are paying attention to that. It's becoming even more um, visible in this moment. So equity for all our families, but also equity for our teachers and making sure that as we ask for things as families, we recognize that so many of our teachers are parents themselves and navigating their, their own health and, and family situations. So um, 
I'll wrap there, but I would just say <clears throat> a key question that I, I really bring to this conversation and anytime someone is saying, well, what are parents doing and how are they navigating? Um, I think we really have to ask, what do we want for our kids during this time? Um, I think that trying to create the normal via Zoom, normal in this moment doesn't work. So uh, within my own family, within our organization, with our members, we're really thinking about like, what is it that we want kids to get from this time? Um, and although none of us would choose this moment for sure, um, what are the possibilities it creates? I think those are just some interesting things to consider. So thanks so much for having me and I'm glad to be here. Thank you for sharing and thank you for raising all of those very important points. Um, it truly underscores the, the, again, the partnerships that are needed to make sure that our students' social, emotional health and well-being and their academic success are taken care of during this critical moment in time. And so um, bringing in the community into this conversation and, and thinking about how the district is addressing some of those, those issues is really important. And so Mr. Rollins, Quessie Rollins, um, when it comes to families and some of the needs that we've just heard about, how are districts handling these transitions? Um, how are communities supporting the school in this work? What are some ideas that you have and, and some things that you've seen? So thanks, Eric. Yeah, tough conversation. Um, you know, there's nothing normal about this moment. <laughs> and it's, it's, we're nowhere near normal. Uh, and thanks so much, Bethany, for that backdrop, because I think that was a good, that's actually a good place to start in terms of, you know, what families are experiencing in real time. And of course, um, you know, everybody is affected by this all over the entire planet, but some folks are more affected than others. Some folks have more of an ability to kind of ride the storm, other folks not so much. And we know that um, from experience, even pre-pandemic, that, you know, some communities were more vulnerable than others. A lot of communities have been historically underserved. Uh, a lot of communities were already kind of catching hell, to use that, that terminology uh, from an economic, from a racial standpoint, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you have a pandemic and now we find ourselves literally in the middle of, of kind of multiple crises, the pandemic being a public health crisis, right in the middle of that we had a kind of a racial justice police brutality crisis emerge and then all of it, of course, is, exacerbates the economy. And so we're in the midst of an economic crisis and all of that stuff shows up to school and then you have a lack of preparation because Frankly, most folks thought this would be over by now and that we'd kind of sort of be able to go back to school in, in a normal way by now, um, and we're simply not. So you see fits and starts and all throughout the crisis uh, from its onset, um, we've literally, our organization works nationally and so we've convened uh, all of our partners all over the country, we're educators, community-based folks, school districts, states, et cetera, since mid-March on, on a weekly basis in some way, shape, or form. And so it's given us a unique kind of view into the ways in which folks have handled, handled all of this from its onset, even up to now. And you find that uh, for the most part, districts uh, obviously were caught off guard. We had to kind of overnight go into some semblance of distance learning. And one of the basics, just to back up just a, just a tad, if you think about this at the level of capacity building, uh, you know, for me, one of the ways I've, I've come to understand this in a very simple, simple way uh, that guides all of my work is you know, the best way to improve outcomes for, for kids is to build the, cap, the capacity of the adults in their lives. And that's their parents and families and caring adults um, in their home life. Uh, and that's everybody else that has some kind of role in, in guiding their healthy development. So all of the adults need their capacity built. All of the adults needed their capacity built and supported before the pandemic, right? And schools and districts were at various levels of sophistication or lack thereof of, of that enterprise. Um, and so some places, uh, and what we found in the midst of the crisis is that places that had good family engagement at the school level and at the district level were in a better position. Everybody was overwhelmed, but they were in a better position to kind of innovate, to kind of um, serve their families, to find their families um, because they already had, um, you know, connections and good engagement. Places that already had uh, a history of partnership uh, and collaboration uh, were in a better position to respond to immediate needs. Uh, places that didn't just just weren't um, and so and then even in places that had 
you know, reasonable levels of partnership, they still had difficulty even finding their families, especially large, large districts, just completely out of touch. Or they didn't have the budget. Uh, uh, I think of one really large district in Florida that, you know, it's got 200,000 kids. They didn't have the money to, to, in their budget to provide Chromebooks. Oh, so that automatically limits options in terms of, of if we can work the, the, the desire to go uh, yeah, somebody needs to mute themselves. The desire to go uh, virtual when you can't get the equipment out to folks, not to mention um, helping folks understand how to manage this. So again, using capacity building as a frame. And so overnight, you, you, you go to distance learning. You haven't had a chance to prepare for it. You don't necessarily have the equipment for it. Educators, even the most savvy, tech savvy educator still needs some some assistance <laughs> in managing that. And God help them if they actually have kids. You know, I have I have coworkers with uh, one coworker I love to pick on that has all this responsibility. He's got three boys and a husband at home. <laughs> and she's part of our leadership. So she's juggling all kinds of stuff. You know what I mean? So I mean, so you think about that just at that level. And so uh, districts have struggled um, in the run up to reopening conversations because, again, we didn't necessarily use our time wisely, thinking that this would be over. Then that caught a lot of places off guard uh, in terms of, oh, my God, so we, we, we're not going to be able to open normally. So do we do now? <laughs> so they weren't prepared for that. Um, they didn't necessarily, some places didn't necessarily do a good job consulting their families. And so they came up with elaborate plans and behind closed doors only to have families, the community, their educators reject the plans because they didn't feel safe. So there's all of those kinds of examples and, and I won't go much further, but I think um, for me, the, the, the frame that is still most important is the capacity building frame. And so we weren't prepared we weren't in a position to kind of build the capacity of all the adults that now need to have a new set of skills in a moment like this, not to mention all of the additional stressors and the additional issues that one has to juggle uh, attendant to this. Um, and so we are playing the worst game of catch up ever. <laughs> and, and so this whole notion, I guess the last thing I'll say, this whole notion of how we give ourselves the breathing room to just say, okay, so we screwed this up. We didn't get it right. We're behind the eight ball. We're never going to catch up. How do we minimize? How do we take a deep breath and collect ourselves, minimize damage, minimize harm, and easily ease into kind of preparation for this, this next stage? Because eventually we will have to ease back into schooling in buildings and et cetera. And, you know, uh, several months from now, and we still have all these other things to juggle. So there's a lot to figure out. Yeah, there certainly always is a lot to figure out. And I appreciate you, uh, you bringing that perspective to us. And, and I, I liked how you, um, you said that the best way to improve outcomes for kids is to improve the capacity of the adults in their lives, because that really speaks to, again, the partnership that must exist, because the adults in their lives are not just their parents or guardians, it's those adults that they may, maybe see on the way to school in the buses or in the cafeterias, the lunch, uh, you know, the, the cafeteria workers or the educators that are sitting bus by their side um, in the normal uh, environment, let alone in this remote environment with all the other adults that, that are needed to support them in their social emotional health, as well as their academic success. So um, let's talk to uh, one of those educators, Rodrigo Rodriguez Tolar. Um, Tell us a little bit more about what schools, um, I guess, from your perspective as an educator, um, how can families help educators in this time? And, and um, I'm just gonna throw this in there too because it, it was typed in into the chat. Uh, Mary Claire Mahler uh, asked, um, how, how are we working with teachers to support families without overwhelming the teachers themselves who might already have a full plate and or children or care recipients at home that they're, that they're trying to deal with? So, Touch on all those things if you can, senor. Okay, of course, Eric. I'm actually really happy to be here today, though, and just to have an opportunity to be able to share a little bit of everything that I have been doing, at least in Austin, Texas, while working with um, the families of our babies. 
My point of view, Eric, as an educator, comes from working with uh, English learning students. Therefore, I support a lot of EL families. Okay, I believe that supporting EL families uh, will help them to transition to virtual learning during these uncertain times. So, as an instructional coach and as a teacher, when I have the opportunity to visit the classrooms, one of the most important things that I try to remind those teachers is one important word that comes to my heart during these um, uncertain times, which is we had to be vulnerable because we had to understand the different situations in which of the of the families of our students. You know, like I work in a I work in a Title One school with a lot of the students are immigrants coming from different countries, and they also have refugee students. And as a matter of fact, um, during this uncertain time, I was doing a little bit of research tools, which at the end I'm gonna share something that it has been working uh, for me and the different teachers that work at Cook Elementary with the Austin ISD. Is I came across this article that is titled Getting to Know Yellow Families by Lydia Present, in which she highlights eight strategies. <clears throat> and this article has been really, really helpful because I've been utilizing those strategies while working with EL families. So for example, I can just give you a quick overview. So for example, one of the strategies that she highlighted is that I had to be creative. You know, like working with EL families, most of the families of her babies, at least at the school that I work at, um, they have two or three jobs though, you know, so they, they had to be <clears throat> able to continue supporting those kiddos, especially uh, until they get home after work. And sometimes those families, they get home until like five or 6 p.m. And then so we had to be able to understand the different situation and different scenarios as to continue reminding the teachers just to be vulnerable. You know, I try to send the emails or try to call them almost every single day during the first two weeks. This, this is our second week as going back to going back to virtual learning. And, uh, you know, like the more communication that I have with them is going to help me along the way so that I can build those, not even I'm only supporting those families, but I'm also building the relationships with them because I would like to continue having an opportunity to get to know my students to make an impact on their learning. And uh, sometimes when we have different uh, refugee students, so I try to contact uh, the bilingual department to make sure that they have any interpreters available in which they can help me just to communicate with them though, you know, because I want to make sure that sometimes the language can be a barrier that can be an obstacle within the learning process. So one of the strategies that Lydia mentioned within the getting to know the families is just to be creative as communicator. Another one that uh, I have an opportunity to collaborate with my principal, even though we're not supposed to go back to campus, uh, the second strategy that she highlights within this article that I would like for a lot of people to read it, and it's actually published by any, um, NEA, uh, is think outside of the box. So for example, <clears throat> um, like I mentioned, I work with a lot of EL families in which their English is not their first language. And uh, so I asked my principal, like, hey, so we're not, that we're not supposed to go back to campus, but I would like to take the opportunity to make myself available just to be, you know, like at the front of the school to make sure that I can continue showing those families how to be able to utilize the iPads or the Chromebooks that they're getting from the school districts. So, like, you know, like when I was there, I also noticed like a lot of the families, they don't even know how to push those buttons on the iPad. Though. So it's really sad, you know, that I had to take the time to be able just to, to show them what to do because a lot of them, you know, during, during those meetings, a lot of the kids they had to use Zoom. So a lot of them, they get frustrated because I mean, they don't know how to input those numbers, the codes, the ID, and then they had to transition from the math teacher to the language art teacher. And then at some point they had to go to language art, I mean, to special areas, to art, music, and they had to use different codes. So we have a lot of conversations. I love my school because we collaborate and help each other. So we work as a family. So being vulnerable is one of the most important keys that is gonna help a lot of educators during this time. And uh, um, like I said, we just try to make simple things that the simpler the process it is, I mean, it will be so much helpful for them as just to something simple as to being able to set up like an easy password for them to be able to remember for Zoom due to the fact that they had to transition to different classes. You know, something really simple makes them really happy. I can tell you by these two weeks that I've been helping them, as soon as they walk outside of the school, they, I just see them, it, it, it brings a lot of passion to my heart because I see their faces that at least are comfortable, that they're gonna continue helping uh, their babies at home. Because one of the things that I'm at in my school district is like, if the student doesn't show up to the Zoom meetings, automatically it will project as they were absent. But I was like, wait a second, how is it possible that you're gonna pray that they're absent if they're trying to do their best? You know, that's what's something that breaks my heart. So that's what I'm trying to, uh, I constantly keep sending emails to the teacher like, hey, if you still have families, just send them to me. So I'm going to continue helping them, explain them what to do because the pre-K to second grade teachers, they have to use ESO 
the platform to be able to interact with the teachers. And then the third through fifth, they have to just blend the LMS. So LMS is a little bit different from them, but at the end, uh, I make myself available to continue helping them. Another one is that uh, after being vulnerable, we just want to make sure that we make them feel comfortable. You know, like <clears throat> sometimes I usually tell the teachers just to call them just to see how they're there, how they're doing though. You know, like the, the school district provides us these wonderful curriculum during this transition and on certain times. But at the same time, they were lacking a lot of opportunities to build those relationships with the students. Like they were expecting for the teachers on day number one to start teaching. I was like, no, I mean, something important that we build with them is just to make sure that they're comfortable. You know, like if we show up on Zoom, at least just ask them like, hey, can you please show me something that you're proud of? And sometimes they just bring like an even shoe when they were babies. You know, like we just start with those connections with them and eventually we move into the families because not, Eric, not only we had to teach those babies, we had to teach their parents at the same time. So you, it is really, it's really cool though. I know it's cool because, I mean, you can have an opportunity to see those babies, but at the same time, you see their parents in the background. So it's actually, it's a learning process that a lot of people, they have to collaborate. And uh, another thing though, is just to get in a sense of the home situation. You know, like I mentioned before, a lot of the families, they had two or three jobs in order for them to be able to support their families. And, and one of the ways that I had to help them with the situation is just to make sure that we can provide all the resources in different uh, languages due to the obstacles that they, perhaps they, they can be. And then just made myself available just to go to school and then continue helping them. And as a matter of fact, NEA also created uh, a wonderful uh, blended learning uh, course that is titled, How Can I Increase Involvement and Partner with ELF Families? Maybe Mr. Martinez can give a little more information in regards to see if any of the educators pre uh, on this webinar may be interesting. It has a lot, it will provide you a lot of ideas, a lot of resources to continue making an impact on the student learning during this time. But once uh, are able to help them, I mean, it's gonna make a lot of difference. But something that I wanna keep standing out and something to share with uh, all the educators across the nation is that we have to be vulnerable though, during these uncertain times because if we're not vulnerable, the learning process is gonna be a nightmare. So that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> wow, but I'm sure your students and your families really appreciate all that you're doing. And, and I think again, going back to the, the improving the capacity of the adults in their lives. And part of that is what you just described. Um, and, and I liked how you brought in the administration and that I would call it a labor management collaboration that, you know, when you're working together to help address the needs of our students and you're also partnering with the families. And this is one of the things that Mr. Rollins brought in as well, that um, those schools where you already had family involvement and you had community partnership and it was sustained, they actually responded more quickly um, to this coronavirus pandemic than some of the other ones. And so I think um, if, if you wanna know more about some of those types of schools, um, I think you can go to nea.org slash community schools, not to say that those were all community schools, but I know that the ones that are community schools are, are the ones that actually have done that as well. So nea.org slash community schools, um, I think is a great example to, to demonstrate that partnership between um, uh, the community, parents, guardians, and families, and the educators that work in the building too. Um, and that's the, the administrators as well as the ones in the classroom. Um, so that's really awesome. And, and I think, you know, another question that we have is um, coming from the, the, the chat box or actually from the Q&A section. Uh, again, if you have a question, type it in the Q&A, not just in the chat box, but we have a Q&A uh, section where we can respond live to you as well. Um, when students are able to return to in-person instruction, that means in the school building, um, there are going to be a tremendous range of experiences uh, because some, as we've heard, are going to have the technology that they needed. Others are going to, you know, have been fighting with their siblings for the technology because there was only one computer in the household or there wasn't enough bandwidth or uh, as uh, Ms. Robertson was, was sharing, you know, they couldn't afford to have the internet that, that week or that month. Um, so what should we do in partnership to be ready to facilitate each student's growth, especially given those circumstances? And so that's a question for all three of you. What is it that we need to be doing today to prepare for what we know is going to be happening when we return to in-person instruction? Well, you know, I'll take a stab and, 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 and I think, um, you know, I think a big part of it is we need to be in a lot of dialogue and we need to involve everybody. We need to have educators talking with families, talking with decision makers, policy makers, 
because part of the mixed message of this moment is on the one hand, we have this unprecedented challenge and this overnight move to a completely different methodology. But at the same time, we're still relying on old bureaucratic processes to hold people accountable, <laughs> right? So this whole notion of attendance in a moment like this, this whole, you know what I mean? This whole, I mean, there are all these horrible stories um, that are, you know, that emerge every day about you know, some kid uh, showed his classmates a toy gun in the house, so he got suspended. How do you get suspended from from online? You know what I mean? So I, I you know, my, my head goes crazy, and it's like, so okay, I get it. There's a so-called zero tolerance policy, but obviously we're in a different world in this moment, you know. Or so all of those things need to be talked through, teased out. Um, some of the states have done a better job than others of, of really kind of creating systems and structures to have those dialogues. Uh, at the end of this month, for example, the state of California, every district in the state of California was required to create a local continuity plan uh, this year to define a what attendance looks like and to have family input in those plans. And so they've been working on that for the last almost eight weeks. Those plans are due at the end of this month. Um, and they've got to be submitted to their State Department of Education. So that's one of the states that's a little bit more forward thinking. Uh, and first of all, it's a good idea to have a plan. Second of all, it's a good idea to seek family and community input in that plan. <laughs> and then, of course, they still got to figure out how to implement that. So, but that's one of the few states that have been that thoughtful. <laughs> okay. So you've got, when you think about it on a continuum, it's like, so we know this next phase is coming. We know that there's all of these challenges, but how do we create the places to have the dialogue that's necessary to give ourselves almost like a timeout because part of the the accountability, the high stakes accountability mindset is set is still there. And a lot of that stuff just isn't feasible in a moment like this. It's just not feasible across the board. And so why would you add more pressure to an already insane set of conditions? And so that's what I really think would help us begin to prepare. That makes sense. I've talked enough. I'm passionate about this, as you can see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Robertson. Yeah. Um, there's a wonderful meme going around the internet that's like, every, every once in a while you wake up and you remember we're in a pandemic. And it's like, oh, right. Well, how could we possibly think we could keep going as usual, just like Mr. Rollins said. Um, so I'm not nearly as involved in the policy around what are the standards and how are people and teachers being held accountable and all those things. But what I know from my heart and from our members is we just, I'd like to add a 13th year, first of all, I'd like to just assume that we're going to need more. Um, and it, that is not necessarily reasonable. But what I do know is that this is an opportunity to focus on the kids who need the most support, the ones who are already behind. Um, there's a fabulous piece that the founder of Khan Academy had in the New York Times a little while ago. And of course, he's just a guru of online learning. And his key point is that this is a moment for small groups. This is a moment for two and three kids with a teacher. And that's an opportunity. We still have to be able to reach them. We still have to be able to negotiate all of the family issues and the access and all of those other pieces. But um, to prepare for coming back, I think we have to stop pretending that kids are moving through the second grade curriculum. What we need to do is find the kids who weren't ready for the first to the second grade curriculum already and get them working in really concentrated one-on-one -on -one with teachers or small groups with teachers um, so that the gaps, you know, there are always going to be kids who have more support or not. Um, honestly, I think we need to focus on social emotional for everybody and academic for those who are most struggling. And that's the way I feel like we can lessen the academic gap when we come, come back from this, whenever that might be. Thank you for that insight. And Mr. Tovac, Rodriguez. Yeah, and for me, Eric, is something similar to what Ms. Robinson just shared with us. Like, I made myself available. I almost begged my school district to give me an opportunity to be able to collaborate while they were revamping the curriculum for virtual learning because they were missing the social emotional uh, learning part. Like, it was the SEL part is not there. Then it's going to be more challenging and more difficult. So, um, when 
one of the good things that I like about the, the place that I, the school that I work is that we all collaborate with each other. So we have conversations at the end of the day. I work with an amazing principal that continues to support all the teachers and I'm really blessed. I'm actually been there for 15 years at the same school. And uh, um, I just guess uh, when I have conversations with my principal, it's just the part like to make sure that we can continue integrating at least like morning circles, you know, just to see how they're doing, you know. Because a lot of the immigrant students that I have an opportunity to work with, I mean, it's really hard for them just to be at home. So now that they're transitioning to go back to campus on October the 4th, at least that 25% of the students. So the leadership team is talking about perhaps having an opportunity that all of that 25% of the students that are supposed to come back to school, uh, we are kind of uh, emphasizing to bring the ones that they needed the most. So I think that's a good opportunity for us to continue implementing lessons that can be you know, transparent and similar to them, so that way they can be a little bit motivated to within the learning process during this uncertain times. So you mentioned that you have been creative in your communication and outreach to parents um, and guardians. And I was wondering, um, for some of my colleagues uh, in my own high school, um, they've been having some difficulty uh, in connecting with parents because, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so I was just wondering, what are some good strategies for educators reaching out to families whose kids maybe aren't showing up virtually? Um, or, yeah, for, for a variety of reasons, obviously, we don't know. And depending on the age, you know, you can't talk to the kid about it. You got to talk to the parent or guardian about it. So um, sure. how do you reach out? Okay, something that I noticed, Eric, that is that these past two weeks that I have an opportunity to be at a school is that a lot of the parents, they are embarrassed of asking them. So and they will usually get a report from the register at the end of the day in regards to what are the students that are actually showing to, to their virtual lessons. So I can just grab my phone and make myself available to continue calling them and I just ask them. And sometimes they just feel like because they only went to school in the third or fourth grade when they were little. So that's the part that it could be an obstacle. But I just, I just scared of asking a lot of questions. And I keep telling them, no, don't be scared. I mean, it's just, this is something that we are continue helping each other. So if you have a lot of questions, then I would like for you to come and see me so that way I can show you what we're doing or what are the resources that your baby needs to do at home in order for them to be able to participate within the virtual process because otherwise the school district is going to mark them absent. So once they feel comfortable and they identify themselves with me, I mean, that is one of the strategies. I just try to have a lot of transparent communication with those parents and then just make myself available. And uh, I, at this point, a lot of the teachers, they like what I'm doing because they keep sending me these messages. And I, I told them, I'm like, I, I don't care if you can send me this message at any time, as long as the caterer is able to, you know, just to be a participant with the learning process, then that's something that is going to put a smile on my face. You know, like just be, be patient though, because a lot of the parents that you get home after, 5 or 6 p.m. and you know they're a little bit tired and then those babies they had to use the, um, the parents they had to make those cell phones available to them in order for them to be able to access CISO or to access Zoom or you know just to watch the recording from the previous day so just to just to be patient and, and have a lot of transparent communication with them will help along the way. Yeah, I, oh, sorry, go no, ahead. No, no no go ahead Bethany I can wait. I was just gonna say real quick I know that um it is frustrating and I have myself been in Zoom calls where parents are specifically called out by the teacher in chat um, and uh, other parents reporting that, you know, they're on these group messages and the teachers are getting in and saying, why, why isn't your kid there? And so I just, I really appreciated, uh, Rodrigo, your perspective on vulnerability, but also I think compassion with the beginning of every conversation of just what our parents experiencing, what might be getting in the way. Um, the other thing I would say is that a tremendous source, and parents are just sharing this everywhere, that the parent-to-parent -parent communication is so essential. And I know sometimes schools feel that that's like a double-edged sword of parents being in conversation with each other. Um, but I think that is the most essential thing happening right now. So the, the more that schools can facilitate the ability for parents to connect, whether that's through WhatsApp or private Facebook groups, um, text chains maybe, um, but it's such a vibrant way for people to get other information to have that peer support of like you're not the only one going crazy here's the you know the handouts i actually got them or here's the the zoom password that you can't find um, i think we we need to be considering this a, a full court press and community um, parent to parent thank, thank you for that and mr rollins actually um if i could if i can i want to actually um build off of what bethany just shared and ask you and maybe rodrigo as well so when you have parents 
and, and guardians coming together in these small groups and supporting each other. Sometimes parents and guardians who are, uh, are of the marginalized communities, the black and the brown communities, the immigrant communities, they're not a part of that. So what can districts, what can educators, and Ms. Robertson as well, what can parents uh, and, and families do to actually make sure that we are reaching out and being inclusive in these newly created, um, I guess, uh, groups? Well, you know, it varies, um, and, it, and it varies by community because there are, there are a lot of examples where, um, you know, uh, parents and families that we might assume aren't as accessible as we think they should be are very accessible. It requires creativity. It requires, you know, as Rodrigo said earlier, you know, thinking outside of the box, which is, you know, it's a great old term still that still works. Um, you know, in, in our experience, and working with a lot of districts, uh, folks are employing a lot of different ways of doing things. And, and, and many places are enjoying a level of connection and engagement that they never had before. Because while it is true that some families have had um, some, some challenges accessing Zoom and et cetera, in other places, uh, you know, I can think of at least three or four districts that we talked to, we had a, a call with about 10 district leaders of varying sizes, anywhere from 200,000 kids to, to 20,000 kids. And there, some of those districts are having thousands of families connect on, on town hall meetings. And, and the system has been kind of overwhelmed by the response because once folks figure out, and this goes back to really capacity building, once folks figure out how to use stuff, <laughs> right, then they, they're taking advantage of it. And that's actually been a bit of a, but of a silver lining. Um, I think the parent, the parent, the peer piece is critically important. I was on a webinar last week with a with a parent leader. Apparently, it's from Chicago and also from Albuquerque. Uh, and this one woman is the is the lead volunteer at a community school in in Albuquerque. And so, she prides herself in in helping to find families, connect with families, helping them navigate. Uh, you know, so that peer piece is critically important. Um, using uh, you know, not just email, but social media, Facebook pages, Instagram, uh, all of these things uh, are working well. And then some of the larger districts are actually working more closely with their partners um, to do, uh, to kind of be outside of their, their normal role and to help do uh, wellness checks and literally go track folks down. Um, and so some of the really large districts, you know, where thousands of kids they just can't find because they never had good contact information they actually have had partnered with some of their community partners who always seem to have a better way than the typical bureaucracy for finding folks and tracking folks down. So, so you see a range of kind of responses. And I think, uh, and again, it goes to the ways in which we're collecting some of that information because there are some silver linings uh, in this moment as well. And as we going back to your earlier question about transitioning back to to, to you know, being more in school than not, how do we not lose some of the innovative stuff that happened that was actually a, a real positive? Um, and how do we, because in some ways, um, you know, distance learning isn't perfect, online learning isn't perfect, but if we can figure out a way to, to master it and have it be a tool later, then it really can be the kind of thing that helps to accelerate growth and uh, you know, help us combat, you know, this, this learning loss that we know is, is evident. And then Eric, for me, it's just, uh, I hear a lot of the word of collaboration though, like just to continue having an opportunity to collaborate with the people that work in your campus. As a matter of fact, um, at least um, the schools uh, within Austin SD, one of the parts that they struggle is the language though, you know, because it's a ELF family, so English is their second language. So we have to make sure that at least when those babies are working within the different platforms that we decided to implement for virtual learning, that to make sure that <clears throat> maybe those teachers are able to, you know, just to change the settings of the platform from English to Spanish, so that way they can reach out to the parents. Because like I mentioned before, the parents are actually helping those babies to continue working on their homeworks. So I think it is important to, uh, to take the language into consideration, so that way it will diminish the language, I mean, the, the frustration, so that way they can continue being involved within the learning process. And also, uh, Mr. Rollins mentioned the tools. The tools are important. And uh, I have an experience to continue learning about one of the NEA blended learning courses that is advocating for EL families. 
in which they, they can provide educators an opportunity to create an advocacy plan though. So the app, create an advocacy plan to try to involve a lot of stakeholders. It will be a phenomenal opportunity, you know, for, to continue uh, helping those babies to be successful and also continue making an impact on a student learning during uncertain times. Thank you. Um, so I think we probably have time for one last question. And I think all three of you should probably chime in on this. And um, here's what is being asked. Um, the person says, I completely agree with all that is presented in the dual capacity framework, building capacity in the adults in the children's lives, building efficacy, et cetera. I know several educators that have adopted the same ethos. However, I know that educators, even those without the responsibilities of giving care at home are stretched pretty thin right now. What might be a strategy for helping not only educators, but families and district leaders and administrators see that involving families, even simply listening to them, will reap strong benefits? So how do we get folks at the um, families, but educators, district leaders, school administrators, how do we get all of us to know that this is something that's worthwhile, listening to families? involving families yeah well i'll take a quick stab i mean we've, we've just got to keep pushing that issue because and some of it requires a change in mindset you know um and you know people you know that's why these things are really capacities and capabilities even how you look at other folks you know we have unfortunately we're in we're in a, a weird moment now I mean, that same parent i mentioned yesterday talked about how our kids are afraid to speak spanish on the street because they're in an environment where you could be targeted for violence if you're speaking Spanish. And so they just rather not speak Spanish, even though they're bilingual. Now, any other part of the world, that's a huge strength being bilingual. But our culture in this moment kind of frowns on that. And so it requires all of us to push that envelope um, and to recognize that, it's, that these are capacities. And, you know, some people have a higher emotional intelligence than others and realize, OK, so the fact that this person can't speak English well doesn't mean that they are ignorant. It just means that they can't speak English well. Just like the fact that I can't speak French doesn't mean I'm stupid, right? <laughs> I just can't speak French, you know? So, but those are mindset shifts, you know, and we've got to all work on that. And those of us who are in positions of authority, of influence, et cetera, really have to use our authority and influence um, to push, push the envelope uh, and to the extent that we make decisions, um, leadership decisions, et cetera, to really hold hold our colleagues accountable, help folks learn how to do things. Zoom is incredible. I, I, I was on a Zoom meeting where it was there were six different languages going on at the same time. Everybody had a channel. I listened to the meeting in German for a minute because I hadn't heard this topic in German before. I mean, you know, so all of this stuff is pop. The technology is there. So it's really about the our willingness and our open-mindedness. And so and that requires all of us to push the envelope and to push our colleagues uh, and also to teach and support our colleagues um, in, in learning, because these are all things that we can learn how to do better. Yes, thank you. And um, Mr. Rodriguez, Tobac, again, how do you get educators to recognize that listening to families um, is important and actually would reap rewards? Yes, yeah, so we continue. Try to keep I love, to a minute because we're running out of time. <laughs> okay, not a problem. I, I usually love the term that pushing the envelope. I'm going to remember that one, though. Just to continue uh, collaborating with each other and, as a matter of fact, creating advocacy, an advocacy plan, you know, try to identify the aisles that perhaps are going to help us and the stakeholders, perhaps, I don't know, going to the school boards and, use, you know, just to continue pushing them because it's all about the kids, though. That's what we're here for. Yeah, thank you. And, Ms. Robertson, final, final thoughts on this. How do we make sure that your voices as families and, and uh, parents are included in, in what we're doing? Uh, I would just come back to grace and compassion. Um, I think that we have to, all of us, just to get through this time, no matter what we're dealing with, um, this is about seeing each other in our vulnerabilities and in our tough moments and just acknowledging that. And um, as parents, I'm hopeful that we can all enter those conversations as like, this is version 1.0 for this school year because uh, we all know it's changing minute to minute and day to day and I think we have to have compassion for the educators that are trying so hard to navigate it so I would say that and then also finally just if we can't ask together what we want for our kids I guess it's, it's not gonna work we have we have to be on the same page about what we're looking for for our children um, 
and make sure that everyone's at the table to talk about them. Thank you. And I think that goes back to your, your, your question, your uh, fundamental question. What do we want for our kids at this time? And so I think community members, family members, educators, we all have to be able to answer that question and hopefully we all want the same thing. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you for uh, beginning this partnership between WETA and the NEA. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to two people from each of those organizations. Uh, I'm from the NEA, but I'm not gonna turn it over to myself. I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea Prejean, who's the Director for Teacher Quality over at the National Education Association, and also to Noel Gunther, who's the Vice President for Learning and Interactive Media at WETA Public Television. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Eric. And I think Andrea asked me to go first, so I will. Um, I oversee national education projects at WETA, which is the flagship PBS station, Washington, DC. We operate big national websites for families and educators, including Reading Rockets, which is about teaching young kids to read, and Colorín Colorado, a bilingual site for the parents and educators of English language learners. A few months ago, Andrea and her colleagues at NEA reached out to us at WETA see if we could all work together to share information online with parents and educators as we all wrestle to help kids to cope and hopefully even thrive during the pandemic. It took us about 10 seconds to say yes to that suggestion and it's already been an incredibly rewarding collaboration. Bethany Robertson led off tonight's program by saying that parents are exhausted and that's obviously true for teachers as well. There's never been a school year like this and it's still only September. For me, the one consolation amidst this crisis has been the stories we hear every day from educators and parents who are going above and beyond. Some of these teachers seem to me almost superhuman, like Luciana Lira, an ESL teacher in elementary school in Stamford, Connecticut. She has such a close relationship with her students and their families that when one boy's parents contracted COVID when the mom was eight months pregnant, Ms. Lira wound up taking the baby home with her and caring for the baby for more than a month while the parents recovered. Sometimes though, it's just the simple and less dramatic acts of kindness that can make a big difference. There's a high school teacher we heard from this morning who's doing double sessions every day, teaching in person and virtually, and working almost every hour to prepare. But he still makes time every week for his whole class online and in person to kick back for an hour and just talk informally and openly about what's really going on in their lives outside of schools. We all know from our own experience that it's that kind of personal connection that makes a difference for young people and that ultimately can change their lives. So we're really humbled and grateful to be joining NEA in this effort and trying to assist all of you and serve all of you um, in trying to keep kids on track. Thanks so much. Thanks, Noel. So just to, to uh all of this together one thing that I really noticed from all of our panelists is that relationships are incredibly important. Um, Kwesi talked about the relationships that were um, developed in community schools and the fact that they were able to reach parents so much quicker and Rodrigo talked about how the relationships he has with parents made him made them um, open to asking him and then Bethany talks about relationships between parents and that those parents are reaching out to each other um, in order to be supportive. And so when we looked at who we could partner with around this really important work to support our members um, and to support families and to support kids, um, calling WETA uh, WETA was, was not an issue for us and it didn't take us a very long time to actually decide what that group was that we wanted to reach out. We have had a partnership with WETA for, for quite a while on very specific issues. Um, and so we're really excited that we're expanding that. We invite you to watch our website, educatingthroughcrisis.org, so you can see what kinds of projects we will be um, rolling out over the next couple of months. We have lots of exciting things coming. And we really invite you to share the information tonight across your networks. Um, the information from our panelists tonight being led by Eric um, was really um, exciting and I think really important and to the extent that we can reach out to Bethany's two million members, to our three million members, to Quasi's folks across the country um, with the Institute for Educational Leadership and with WETA's um, 
millions of people who, who tune in every evening and every day to watch um, their programming. I think we um, can support students across the country. So let me um, let you know in a couple of days, give us a couple of days, this recording will be up um, and you can go to nea.org slash webinars so you can download it yourself or send, it, send it, um, an email or URL to your friends to watch. Um, there were, I hope you were able to either copy the chat because there were quite a few number of resources um, that were there. So thank you for this evening. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and um, good evening. Bye-bye.